All right. Well, I am leading a discuss, uh, discussion on revolution, uh, and it's going to be very slow. Uh, very slow. Sorry. Uh, it's going to be relatively short, and then I want to open it up for a wider discussion about what we think of revolution. Um, I want to talk primarily, uh, as many of you know, I have, we have the Why Revolution pamphlet, which covers basic introductions to revolutionary thought. Um, for the most part, I think most of us are on the same page on why we need a revolution um, and the rapacious horrors of capital. Um, but also, what we need to do is, I believe we need to talk about uh, what a revolution is, and from in depth, and from there, most importantly, how to make a revolution. So, uh, when talking about what a revolution is, I want to lay out what I view a revolution is. A revolution is a rising of one class, um, which seizes control and makes itself the ruling class. So, basically, we have a revolution in France, where the capitalist class and the bourgeois class, which is another name for capitalist class, uh, rose up and got rid of the aristocrats and the kings and made themselves the ruling class. Um, what we don't see is a revolution where you have two groups of the same class just replacing each other. So, for example, it wouldn't be a, a revolution with, um, let's say, Nazi Germany, because all you have is you have the rich capitalists who were originally running things under Hindenburg, and then they appointed Hitler uh, to basically be the most openly terroristic element of the capitalist class to support their class interests. And as long as you weren't Jewish, you were allowed to keep your massive factory, even though you had to pretend that it was under state control, you still managed to make profits. And you usually got the benefit of using slave labor from Poland and the Soviet Union in your factory to help make more money for you. So that would not be a revolution. What we need to do is also conceptualize what would a revolution look in the United States. What a revolution would look like in the United States uh, would have three main characteristics. Okay. Uh, the first thing that we need to keep in mind for a revolution in the United States is we need to abolish capitalism and abolish the capitalist class. Uh, what this means is we not, not only need to think about, oh, you know, the people who own the factories, we also need to think about the imperialist global system. It is not enough for us to abolish our local uh, bourgeois, our local capitalists, our local factory owners. We also need to work to dismantle the entire system of international imperialism. This means we need to work not just to destroy uh, or to remove the capitalists as a class, we also need to destroy the institutions that they use for global oppression. This means putting a stop, and this is actually a fight that we can target more clearly. We need to fight against the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, uh, which gives bad loans to um, all the poor developing countries in the world and then exploits them through those loans. We also need to target the World Trade Organization, which again creates unfavorable conditions for uh, poor countries in which they become exploited uh, both by the loans and the super interest that they can't ever pay back, but also the resources we take from them. And then also we need to fight against all so-called free trade agreements um, both uh, in North America and abroad. Um, the most famous of this were the NAFTA free trade agreements. The NAFTA free trade agreements uh, basically rewrote the Mexican economy, uh, removing Mexican farm owners' property rights to have their land communally, and put two million uh, farmers out of work so that they were left with little choice but to go to the United States to try and find work, or to stay in Mexico and starve to death. So we need to but it's also very important that it's not just NAFTA. If anyone recalls, Barack Obama, so again, NAFTA was passed by uh, Clinton. Um, you had the uh, GATT, um, oh, which is the uh, something agreement on trade and tariffs. Oh, the global, global agreement on uh, trade, trade and tariffs. And tariffs. <laughs> yeah, so the GATT, uh, GATT was pushed under both Reagan and Bush. Uh, you had the Bush administration passing all sorts of free market and deregulation uh, stuff, especially early in their administration. And then you have Barack Obama, for example, just passing the free market agreements in South Asia, or uh, Southeast Asia, which included South Korea and Japan. So we need to stand against all of these. So again, first, we need to not only attack the capitalist class, uh, which is you know, going to be a huge conflict, we also, and more, in a more manageable fashion, need to attack 
the free market imperialist trade agreements the United States uses, not the United States necessarily as its people, but the United States as the governments and the rich, to dominate the world uh, wide. So there's that. Second, uh, we also, and, and relatedly, uh, we need to target uh, national chauvinism, but especially we need to target class privilege. Um, if we look to Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, what he found is that sometimes the capitalist class would use the super profits gained from imperialism, right, from exploiting, like, say, poor people in Guatemala to sell, you know, uh, bananas for cheap, or outsourcing you know, through free market agreements, right, all of the American jobs to, say, India. Um, from the profits made there, they could then spend that those super profits to buy off a, por a portion of the working class. Now, it's not just any portion of the working class they buy off. They buy off essential portions of the working class. The managers, uh, the technical officials. Uh, in Lenin's times, it was the people who worked the trains. In our time, it's people who control uh, information technology, who control investment firms, uh, who control um, trade, unions. trade unions. Right, These sorts of people get bought off to become um, essentially less militant and to cease to fight for the working class and instead become uh, corrupt labor aristocrats, which is to say people who are more concerned about their own privilege than they are about the worldwide working class movement. So along with fighting imperialism, we also need to fight the effects of imperialism uh, domestically here in the United States. What an, a revolution would look like to us would also mean calling out the class privilege that comes with being American. Um, to call out the devastation that is happening to us and to not uh, parrot the uh, Democrat and Republican, Republican lines about the shrinking middle class. When they talk about the middle class, what they really mean is the people who have been bought off by the rich. Now, thankfully, in a certain sense, uh, global imperialism has become weakened and the capitalists have become even more greedy. You only need to look at the rate in which the rich are becoming richer to see that they care less and less about buying off the working class. At this point, that is actually a benefit for us. Americans, more than probably any other time, are becoming aware that the rich and the elite in the United States do not care about them. They do not want to protect them. But we're in this transitionary period. We are transitioning from the period that happened, say, in the, uh, from the 50s to the 70s, where the capitalists would buy off the working class, but we're not yet fully to the period where rather than buying off the working class, they actively suppress them. But you only need to look at the repressive laws in regards to immigrants, uh, the repressive laws in regards to labor, the repressive laws in regards to even things like healthcare, uh, where working class people are forced to buy healthcare from the rich elites, from the capitalists who make a profit off of it, uh, that we are moving into a period of absolute repression. But we have a brief window in which we are not facing full oppression and we are not facing a uh, fully bought off working class. So it's vital, again, as the second point, that we organize against class privilege in the United States. And third, and probably the least popular of all the things that we need to keep in mind for what a revolution would be in the United States would be, would be a national liberation struggles. We need to stop imagining that a revolution is going to be an American revolution. There is no America, there are not Americans. There were white English, not just white European, but primarily white English landowners who continue to exploit labor. Um, there's a very interesting book if you want to learn more about this. Uh, it's called How the Irish Became White. Originally, the European settlers were, uh, were white Europeans, and they viewed all the other European settlers as below them. If you have any questions about this, look at the laws suppressing, for example, Catholics. These laws suppressing Catholics lasted throughout all of our basic history. And in fact, John F. Kennedy was such an amazing figure because he was the first Catholic ever elected. Now, this was because religion was tied up to national origin. They did not view uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, did not view the Irish, did not view the Lithuanians, not view the Germans, not view the French as the same sort. 
Now, that struggle has mostly passed. Um, white culture has begun to adopt itself. So except for a few holdouts, that's too bad Matt Sievers isn't here, uh, who view, for example, the Irish as uh, a, an oppressed nationality, um, basically white culture has been more or less integrated. This means, though, that we need to focus again on the oppressed nationalities, that a revolution of white uh, European colonists uh, which we should support. We should support a revolution of the white working class. But it needs to be a unity, an alliance, of not only the white working class, but the Chicano and Mexicano working class, and also um, the American Indian working class, and also uh, the black working class. So that each working class is fighting for liberation, both globally, uh, which is to say throughout the United States, but also as oppressed nations. We need to look, in my view, we need to look back to Lenin and the Soviet Union, where you had communists of every nationality, of Georgian, of Ukrainian, of Russian, of Kazakh, um, of Turkmenistani, who all were fighting for the overthrow of the Tsar and the Russian Empire, but were also fighting for national liberation of their own oppressed countries. That needs to be the model, I believe, of what we view a revolution in the United States as, a multinational working class revolution. So again, what we need to understand the revolution as is again, against the imperialism uh, and the exploitation, not just domestically, but the imperialism uh, practiced abroad and globally. We need to fight against class privilege of the labor aristocracy and those who basically are being bought off by the capitalists domestically. And we also need to keep in mind that we need to struggle for oppressed nationalities and for their liberation. This is what I see a revolution to be. Now, the question is, how do we make a revolution? Now, in this case, um, there are a lot of disagreements, and I'm going to give a brief sketch of what I think that we need to do. What I think we need to do is uh, threefold as well. One, uh, revolutionaries need to be on the forefront of every struggle, just hands down. We need to be at the forefront of the immigrant rights struggle. We need to be at the forefront of the labor struggle. We need to be at the forefront of the LGBTQ struggle. We need to be at the forefront of the anti-war struggle. We need to be in front of uh, the women's struggle and we need to be in front of the national liberation struggle. But part of the question is then, how do we move forward from that? This goes to my second point. We need to engage in revolutionary activity and organizing and win the working class uh, through our mass line work. Now, what is our mass line work? Uh, the mass line work has three main components. I know it seems like I'm doing a lot of threes, but it really is. Uh, what I have found through my struggles is there are three ways, generally speaking, to win over the working class. One is through the work itself. Two is through uh, class analysis and prediction. And three is through class analysis um, and explanation. Um, actually, we should reverse those. Work, explanation, prediction. So let me go through what these methods mean. Uh, as all of you may know, or some of you may know, um, we had a massive immigrant rights rally, uh, and it was a lot of work. Um, and that meant printing out flyers, that meant flyering at track stations, that meant talking to people, that meant contacting, um, you know, uh, media, that meant, uh, you know, just doing work. And in that mass organization, uh, I and other comrades had gained the respect of the working class people in that organization simply because we are out doing the work. When a flyer needs to be designed, they know to go to us, the communists. When flyers need to be passed out, they know to go to us, the communists. When uh, a message needs to be sent, they know to go to us, the communists. When an article needs to be written, they know to go to us, the communists. This is one of the ways in which we can work, uh, earn the trust of the working class. But if we're just acting as uh, you know, workers in this movement, there's no reason to believe that our struggles will ever raise their consciousness above just doing immigrant rights work. 
above just doing union work, above just doing uh, you know, uh, women's rights work or anti-war work. So we also need to conduct our work with an openly positive communist uh, perspective. This brings me to the other two points, communist analysis and, uh, and classic class analysis. The other way in which we help move people towards communism and help build the revolutionary movement is we need to use our expertise as communists, we need to use our understanding as communists to openly give a Marxist analysis or, or revolutionary, I will say Marxist because I'm a Marxist, analysis of the situation. We need to explain, for example, why the men and men are anti-immigrant even though they have an apparent working class background, right? And you know, in this case, explain that actually most of them are relatively well-to-do or are in the middle and don't want to lose their class privilege, right? We need to explain why, for example, immigrants come to the United States and the reason why, of course, is free trade devastating Mexico and them being left with no other position but to move here, right? This sort of explanation, or explaining why the United States goes to war and what its real objectives are as opposed to its stated objectives. By giving this sort of explanation in a clear, conscientious, uh, open way, we help move people's consciousness towards socialism, towards communism, and towards revolution. The more we are, uh, liberals, well-meaning progressive liberals, well-meaning activists, they know something's wrong, but they don't, because they don't have a full-on class analysis, they can't understand why it's wrong. Right? They can't understand why Barack Obama is continuing the wars. They can't understand why Barack Obama is bailing out the banks. They can't understand why the Democrats don't fight for their class interests. They can't understand why uh, the LGBTQ community is not getting equal rights. They think it's wrong. They want to work against what they think is wrong. But it's our explanation that is really going to open their eyes to the systemic nature of the oppression. <laughs> That's actually really good. Um, and then the third thing we need to do is we need to be at the forefront of prediction. We are not magic eight balls. We are not crystal balls. But if we are strongly rooted in uh, our revolutionary theory, our revolutionary understanding, we constantly strive not only to understand the theories and um, uh, laws, and I don't mean laws in a strong sense, but basic trends that govern history, uh, and we do a concrete analysis of this situation, um, we can begin predicting where it's going. And by predicting where it's going, we begin to make the working class understand we are not just a bunch of jokers who are angry, who don't know what's going on, and are a bunch of crackpots, right? The more accurate our predictions are based on firm analysis, the more they understand we are not engaged in conspiracy theory. We are engaged in a concrete analysis of our situation, and we can actually begin, not perfectly, but we can begin charting the course of capitalism. Let me give you two examples from my life. Election night. Barack Obama's election. I was the least popular person on election night. And the reason why I was the least popular person on election night is I said, look, Barack Obama is part of a capitalist party. The Republicans have one capitalist agenda, and it is a distinct capitalist agenda. And the Democrats have a different but distinct capitalist agenda. So there will be some differences between them, admittedly, but by and large, they will carry out the same general policies. This, as you can imagine, was not popular on the night of hope and change. No, Barack Obama's different. He's not going to bail out the banks like Bush. No, Barack Obama's different. He's not going to support big oil. Actually, let me go through. He's not going to bail out the banks. What was one of his first actions as president? Bailing out the banks. And TARP, TARP 2, actually. Uh, Barack Obama is not going to support big oil. What was one of the first things he did? Open and expanded offshore oil drilling. Also, he capped the amount of damages that BP had to pay, right? Barack Obama is going to continue the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan despite the fact he promised we would be out in a year. We are still in Iraq. We still have thousands of contractors in Iraq. We are escalating the war in Afghanistan. Why? 
Not because Barack Obama is a bad guy, just like Bush is a bad guy, but because of our class analysis of both the Democratic and Republican Party and the structure of capitalism, we were able to predict how these people would function or how these parties would function, right? All those people who were angry and hostile to me on that election night, I repeated as an incredibly unpopular principled position, I repeated day after day, month after month, year after year. And now many of those same people understand and agree with me that whether it's Republican or Democrat, we also, that they're essentially the same, two sides of the same coin. And, but, but retroactively, this is what separates us from say the Tea Party. The Tea Party is now so concerned about our liberties, right? But if you talk to any liberals, they hate the Tea Party after this, right? And they just say, oh, you know, Bush and Obama, the same thing. But they're only saying that now after the fact, right? They're only saying that after Bush left and after Obama carried out these policies. And so it looks disingenuous and self-serving. In order to have your predictions have any weight whatsoever, you need to be bold with them. You need to admit when you're wrong, but also you need to do your best to see when you're right. The second thing, I don't know if you remember, it was, I believe, last week. What did I say was important about Tunisia? I said what was not important about Tunisia was Tunisia itself. What was important about Tunisia is this would create an opening for revolutionary struggles all across the Middle East and North Africa, right? Does everyone remember that? Absolutely. Okay, that's the thing. That was not what was essential. Right? Anyone could say, oh, you know what? Tunisia is really interesting and we should support them. We need to be bold in our predictions that Tunisia sets a precedence for the rest of the movement. Now, obviously, not a lot of people here um, in the United States, not necessarily in this room, don't really care about Tunisia. But it's our ability to begin to predict world events right, and give class analysis that really drives forward the strength of our analysis. And so we need to be bold in our critique and bold in our analysis. So by doing the work, being, uh, providing explanations and giving predictions, we can move people towards revolutionary ideology. Um, and these are the main methods. So uh, what else? Besides being in the forefront of, the struggle, of all struggles, besides, again, this tripartite uh, nature of work, we also need to constantly be openly and passionately communist. Now that may seem similar to the first three, or the, you know, the three methods of work, but also we need to work to build, not just be open, we need to build cadre. Now what is cadre? Cadre are the most advanced people in the movement. They are the most advanced thinkers, and they are the most advanced who do work. We need to build, right, a group of people and train a group of people as we're going to constantly do more work, to do more analysis, to do more defense and explanation. Um, again, uh, I do not mean this in any way uh, to be self-aggrandizing, but when we began this communist movement, I was one of the few people engaged in communist work, and I did a very bad job of it. For an entire year, I wasted my time doing really bad communist work, not doing a very good job of explaining things, not doing a very good job of you know, giving class analysis. But now, uh, we have a whole cadre of people who do strong work and do good analysis, right? We have Chris, who's able, who initially uh, was an Irish communist, who you know, didn't support Lenin, didn't support Marx, didn't support the Soviet Union, didn't support you know, the revolutionary communism around the world, uh, as far as I know, didn't support national liberation struggles. And yet now he is one of the most passionate. He, he can, uh, again, he does a massive amount of communist work. He designs flyers, he books rooms, he uh, does tables, and he runs workshops, right? Does the work. He also is able to provide explanation. Uh, he is able to explain what is going on in the world, what happened in the world, to defend uh, you know, revolutionary struggles in the world. And then also, he's able to make predictions on where the class analysis is going and get people behind that. Chris, you know, Jacob, uh, Brett, uh, Kristen, you know, and, and these are just the people who are on their way to, or are, are already engaged in, uh, AJ, right, 
are already engaged in uh, very advanced communist work. But if you think about it, we also have a whole group of people who are now becoming more and more advanced so that they're beginning to lead their own struggles and be interested in leading their own struggles, of doing their own communist work, of learning about communist class and our, or, uh, sorry, revolutionary analysis, learning about revolutionary prediction and understanding the function of what, the way the world works. So, this may seem somewhat vague. I haven't told you, you know, oh, the revolution's going to break out in Chicago or break out in Salt Lake and spread from there. But, for me, revolution and communism, which is my form of revolution, are not based on some abstract fantasy that we start putting into practice in the world. It's based on the principles that we have being applied to the concrete situation that we're facing. Whether that is immigrant rights and giving a strong national liberation statement, whether that means you know, a, student's, uh, a student rights and giving a good analysis and also doing the work to bring that movement to fruition, whether that means you know, fighting for women's rights and raising awareness through uh, events or pamphlets or putting those together, right? These are the sorts of ways we're going to move. And as we grow our movement, right, both uh, through leading the struggles, engage in communist methods, right, the three communist methods I've touched on, and building cadre within those movements, we are going to continue to grow our movement further and further. Uh, as a side note, I, I'm talking, of course, to the UVU RSU, but in the next few weeks, we will now see a U of U RSU. Woohoo! Yeah, which is expanding our, uh, our, our work and our methods of struggle. Whereas before, people were afraid or hesitant to identify as communists or anarchists, we now have an open movement that is proudly declaring themselves Marxists, Leninists, Maoists, anarchists, and defending the revolutionary history and heritage where previously it would give vague apologies. Well, communism or real anarchism has never been tried. Right? We are moving away from that into real methods of work. And this is what I believe the essence of our revolutionary struggles are at this moment. So I'd like to open it up to discussion. Um, who has thoughts on this? Who do we want to make a circle? Do we want to break into groups? Let's give them a hand. Say revolutionary. You wavered back and forth. You, you said communist and you pointed to Chris and I. I did. That was also, great. You, were, you are both communists. The only one who is not communist would be Kristen, who I named. And I made sure to say revolutionary for you. No, you no, didn't. You said communist. You, you Dude, say just next time, just say revolutionary. Yeah, you like, did. I mean, the, I went, or yeah, socialist. I, I say we can do that. Chris, <laughs> the disappointed <laughs> sock. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> yeah, also, again, 
uh, this will go up on the web, and there'll be this whole like side panel, and it says, "No, this is getting edited." Not it the views. Says, oh yeah, there's that. It says these views do not represent those of the RSU. Yeah. This is. Well, then I can go over. I can go over. Uh, I can go over. Yeah, it's personal view. No, it'll have the jar of pause. We're gonna stop talking. I'll say. <laughs> Honestly, we could retitle the lecture to say communist revolution. It's a discussion on revolution. So again, uh, I think anti-capitalist, socialist, revolutionaries, these are all words you could use. Yeah, again, this is my All right, let's move on. I would say it's, hey, it's really sad. <laughs> I would say it's really sad that Michael Brumis isn't here. Because uh, Michael Brumis would disagree, for example, with the methods of work. Um, he would argue for transitional demands, mass party of labor, mass party of labor, permanent revolution, yes, um, permanent revolution uh, which I don't agree with. If someone, what I have just given is the historical uh, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, mass line approach to revolution. Um, it's based heavily on the freedom red socialist organizations, some points on the mass line. If someone has any alternative ways they see of organizing, actually, and it goes beyond some points on the mass line, like I want to be clear. Also, is that on the left? Yes, it is. <laughs> Um, if someone disagree, again, so I'm giving the communist view of revolution because I'm a communist, and that's why how I view revolution because I'm a communist revolution. <laughs> but if someone wants to uh, give a different view on organizing or what they view a revolution to be, I mean that would be great. We're just saying when you refer to the club in broad strokes, you could use different adjectives. That's all. <laughs> I wasn't saying. I wasn't referring to Did you say long, long strokes? strokes? Broad, broad, broad strokes. strokes. Dude. Oh, I'm not strokes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That story about how the Q&A section doesn't make it on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chris, edit this one. Mom, this is the part that was like. <laughs> uh, okay. So, does anyone have anything serious? Discussion? Any questions? I have a question, but it's not necessarily really related to this topic. Okay. Um, just basically with revolution in general. Like, what happens when you guys like accomplish revolution? Does someone get that man a white revolution pamphlet? Yeah. Do you have one? They're in your trying trunk. to get mine aware. Andrew, do you have one? Hey, uh, I can hey, hey, one. hey, they're in your trunk. I know. Where's also, your card, right? Is it really hard? Can you guys share since? Yeah, we need, we need to get to your car, man. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, this is actually awesome because this is pretty much like the basics. Yep. Yes. Yeah. What a revolution is, why we need it, and uh, the different ways we make well, it. Well, like, I'm just wondering like, what happens after it happens. Does that not like Everybody uh, a little bit of a job, healthcare, um, and education. What I would say is this. Like, <laughs> it's a, it's a, like, once the revolution would ever happen, Jesus it's, comes to me. It's, 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 it's perfect. Uh, here's the thing, there are different views on this, so I'm, um, and that actually includes several different views. That includes anarchism and uh, communism, and different forms of communism, including left communism, Marxism, Leninism, uh, Maoism, Trotskyism, and all of those have different views. Anarchism, it includes anarcho-collectivism, anarcho-syndicalism, anarcho-platformism, um, anarcho-collectivism, all of them. What? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't include that. No, not primitive. So, I mean, actually, here's, the, here's what you're asking about. Right. right. So you have, right, right now, capital society. You could have a revolution in which, you know, all the throws the government and the workers take power. And during that period, yeah, that's the sort of transition out of capitalism towards socialism and now America towards communism. That's just my views. Uh, and, yeah, that could be, that could do, uh, be a lot of different things. There could be counter-revolutionaries both in the country. We could be invaded by, say, China. People are crazy and start to believe it. Or, you know, uh, just Europe, maybe crazy enough to invade us or something like that. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen during when a revolution happens, just like the Bolsheviks did during Russia. They didn't know that you know, the entire world was going to invade the Soviet Union right from the get-go. Um, and then, you know, after the revolution, what is it going to look like? These are, you know, there's principles we just have, we have ideas. But we're going to try to put those ideas in practice and see what they're working on and then find out why the ideas didn't work. Refine those ideas. Um, so it's like, like the, the ultimate, like the very ultimate goal of It depends on what you mean by perfect. Um, I would say a just society. I, I, more just society. It, it really depends on who you're talking to. 
Yeah. I think what's important here is the question you've asked will, can't be answered by anybody else, but the answer you come up with for yourself will determine what kind of revolutionary you are, whether you're a Maoist, whether you're a Marxist, whether yeah, you're a Leninist, like, or an anarchist. Like, this is awesome that you gave me this, because I really don't know much as we go. Yeah, well, I, I mean, here's sort of the thing that I, the way I see it, right? Um, now, the way in which people view after the revolution, even within the same view, within the same viewpoint or a similar viewpoint, they have radically different views and there's radical disagreement. Um, some Marxist-Leninists, or I'll just, I'll just say Mike, Michael Brumis, right? He's a Trotskyist and he is super enthused about industry. And he says, look, what's really holding us back is that all these capitalist jerks are like sucking us dry and bleeding us dry. And so what he says is, look, if we turn over all this industry to the workers, they'll be able to do it like so much better and so much faster. Uh, and his view of communist society is basically, and he said this, uh, I don't know if he was, I think he was actually pretty serious. He's <coughs> like, my view of communist society is like Star Trek. Oh God. Like, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that's my view. Um, you know, where you have basically abolished <laughs> wants, uh, you know, you can get basically any food you want, you know, clothing you want, you can do most jobs you want. Um, there's not like a huge repressive police force to keep you in line or anything like that. Um, and then uh, our newest addition to communism, uh, like Josh West, um, you know, we haven't specifically talked about it, but he's interested in post-industrial societies. So for him, what we would see under communism is rather than this massive expansion of industry, uh, it's really strict control and organization, like breaking down factory farms, getting rid of polluting industries, uh, growing things more uh, organically and locally. So it wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily you know, work less, like Michael Grimace's view of like the Star Trek communism, where we can just get everything we want as we want it. We would actually probably work, in some respects, harder than a lot of us work now. But we would have better distribution around the world, so you wouldn't have starving people. Everyone could have their own sort of society. They could have their own sort of uh, agriculture and industry that simultaneously takes care of their wants and desires, but then also um, uh, basically you know, protects the environment, protects other communities. And you'll notice both of these people identify as communists, and it's the difference of night and day. Um, what I would say is two, two big things. Um, communism for me, I don't know, I've re repeated myself a million times, so bear with me, I know most of you have heard this at least 60 times. Communism for me is two political, uh, two big movements merged together. It's French Republicanism and German Socialism. French Republicanism has two big principles. One is that everybody has a say, and two, that that say is binding, what we, whatever we ultimately decide is binding on everybody, okay? Now, here's the problem. If you just go with French Republicanism, well, okay, everybody has a political say, but then you also have these big corporations who buy people off, who you know, can do whatever they want and we can't really control them because they're not political. Well, German socialism says this, roughly speaking, it's like, wait, property isn't natural, it's a socially constructed concept. And because it's a socially constructed concept, we should put this socially constructed concept to the benefit of all of us, right? And this is the essence of socialism is this recognition that private property, or, or just property in general, is a social construct. So you merge them together, well, we should all have a democratic say on what happens to the property, especially when it affects our lives. You know, um, if uh, Bill Gates gets a brain tumor and decides he hates the world, uh, he can crash Microsoft into the ground and screw all of us, right? We don't have a strong say in whether he does or doesn't do that. Um, and also, it's not binding. You know, you always hear this, oh, well, you can vote with your dollars. Well, yeah, you can vote with your dollars, but that doesn't really give us much of a say. And also, it's not binding on the rich elite, you know? We want to vote with our dollars. Well, where do we vote outside of capitalism, right? Where do we vote, where do we get our food outside of capitalism? They have enough control that the corporations can buy up or destroy anything that uh, we want. I mean, you just have to look at Bolivia. They literally bought the water rights to everything. They literally own Coca-Cola literally owned the rain as it fell from the sky. Now, I mean, that they can, uh, they're not obviously bound by our collective decisions, so why should we allow that? So what I would say is there is no communism 
as you know a plan. You know, I'm not gonna you know come up with a plan of oh well we'll have Midwest do this and Utah will do that and Asia will do this and then we'll exchange all these goods and make sure that everyone has X, Y, and Z. What it is is we've got these principles and how every culture and how every revolution is going to put these principles into practice is their decision. And so we won't know what communism will look like, this is kind of going off what Chris says, until we look at our actual movements. I mean, you'll notice I talked about internationalism, uh, you know, and that we need a multinational working class. Well, here's a big question. Is Hawaii and Puerto Rico and the American Indians and the black uh, nation and the Chicanos and Mexicanos, are, are they even gonna wanna be part? of a socialist, uh, or, you know, a communist revolutionary United States? Or would they want their own independent, independent or really independent socialist state, right? Whether a big chunk of the Southwest is part of the uh, you know, United Socialist States of America, or whether it's its own independent entity, right, has a big say on what sort of economy, right, the rest of us have. And there's no way we can determine that beforehand. But roughly speaking, my idea of communism is, or, or socialism as this transitionary period, this is the revolution, is instead of having the state protect the rich, we have the state protect, uh, protect us. Now, how will it protect us? Well, that's the very point of communism, is we'll decide how the state protects us. We'll decide how the state uh, defends us, what is and is not permissible. Um, you know, obviously I have my views, uh, you know, under Michael Broom's car, uh, communism, you know, maybe we have flying cars and everybody owns their own car and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, we just have green cars. For me, I'm not interested in that. And I would argue that the best use of our social resources is, for example, to put, put rail lines everywhere. So that you have a bike, the nearest rail line is like maybe five minutes from you. And from that rail line, you can get not just anywhere in your city, but anywhere in the country. And for me, that seems like the most intelligent use of resources, uh, because you know, once we build those rail lines, they're set. We don't, you know, they're really easy to maintain. Whereas if we build roads and cars and cars and more cars, right, we just end up having to build more and more and more cars to so have like an infinite car traffic jam. Whereas it's easier to run, you know, instead of running trains every half hour, every 20 minutes, we run them every five minutes, every three minutes. And so those sorts of social resources will be the best allocated. Can I tell you for sure? Oh yeah, when we have socialism, we'll have bullet trains running everywhere. No, because that's something we'll decide. And that's just transportation. That's just one fragment of transportation. Um, now again, obviously we all have views that we'd argue for. But for me, what the point of the revolution is to make a worker state. Uh, to make good on the promise you know, said by Abraham Lincoln during Gettysburg, which is a true government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Not a government of the people, for the rich, and by the rich. Does that at all answer? Or? Yeah. A little bit? as much as you can. Well, I mean, I can tell you some things that we'd have are general things. We'd have workers' councils. Uh, we would suppress the capitalists. We would seize their property. Paris Hilton would uh, lose everything and have to get a real job. Uh, Bill Gates would have to go back to programming until he retired, or managing programmers, but he'd actually have to do work. Um, rather than building mansions, we would build, I believe, uh, housing, or we would redistribute housing to the people. I mean, you'll notice we're in the, we're having a huge housing crisis where houses, you know, people are getting thrown out of their houses, but the problem is we have too many houses, right? We have houses sitting empty, mansions sitting empty. You know, what socialism means for me is not this fantastic, you know, biodome where we live in self-contained communities. <laughs> it means, you know, taking the house we have and getting poor people off the street. Those are the sorts of movements that communism, I think, fights for, you know. So does the thing communism is nobody have, like, super nice stuff? Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by super nice stuff. Like, this is no one. I, I, I honestly would say no one would be allowed to have a mansion, but... Multiple people could have one mansion. Multiple people could have one mansion. Four mansions could be vacation houses, which people use. Yeah, this is what they did in the Soviet Union. They had mansions, right? Old mansions. And what you did is you signed up for them. And all throughout the year, they rotated. Timeshares. Yeah, essentially timeshares, right? That's the sort of social solution we have. 
Will there still be yachts? Uh, probably less. Probably not very many. Yeah, well, but I mean, people like to have fun, right? Okay, so we have yachts. Well, instead of some rich jerk-off who uses his yacht maybe two times a year, and the rest of the time it just sits in the harbor, which happens. It happens all the time. Well, well why not take those yachts, put up a sign-up sheet for anyone who wants to use them, and any time that you're not working in a factory or in the field or teaching or doing medicine, you can have a really badass yacht. I mean, that seems like a much better solution than what we're doing now. Or more practically, you can go down to the lake and rent, uh, not rent, but get you know, the people's jet ski and your kids. Jet ski. The people's jet ski. New band uh, name. New band name. Park. And also, I'd emphasize that in this society, uh, since jet corporations jet and corporate entities will take second place to the people's interests, things like national parks will explode and we'll actually start getting back to nature, which is actually more fun than the office in my opinion. Well, and I mean, also, we'll switch, we'll switch to the sort of entertainment we have. Um, you know, sports. I mean, I'm not necessarily a huge sports guy. Uh, sports are big in socialist countries. Why? Because it's public, it's social. Uh, there's very little cost to it. It's a lot of fun. Um, this might resonate with some of you. Music. Right? I mean, we've had, what, three or four different new kinds of music come out of Cuba since the revolution? Why? Well, because you don't have to work in a factory 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week. You work 30 hours a week. And then in your free time, right, you play an instrument. Uh, you don't have to really, you know, maintain the instrument terribly. I mean, there's some upkeep, but it's really cheap. Not only is it a free time for you, but also it's a free time for everybody at the club, everybody at the disco. Um, so what we'll do is we'll move away from these really private uh, sort of pastimes, <laughs> yeah, to schedules or to um, you know public sorts of in enjoyment. And well, again, not to say you can't own certain things, right? And we should we should point out that people can own. You can own a bass guitar, you just can't own the fact that it makes a bass guitar. Right, and you can own books, you can own a library, you can, you can have, yeah. Yeah. Well, and also another thing. I mean, who here has used Microsoft Windows? Yes, people's, okay. yeah. people's, people's windows. windows. Yeah, what you'll notice is you have to pay like 300 bucks for the newest version every time it comes out. And it's also competing Apple with Apple, right? And you have to pay you know, hundreds of dollars to get an Apple computer. Well, why not just build the best computer that we can possibly build? Under communism, there's no rich jerk off to take the cut, which means you won't have to pay dues. If you like a program, just use it. Right? And it's not like this model is crazy. It's like, well, if you don't, you know, if you don't pay people to make stuff, they're not gonna make stuff. I mean, open source software, all the games that get made, most of them are made because people want to make games. And they would still continue to make games, video games, in their free time. They just would do it. And they continue to make them better. They wouldn't have to compromise their vision uh, to corporate, uh, again, jerk offs. Um, anyone would be able to work on them. You know? Is, is yes. jerk off the official term? Uh, yes, that if you if you look to uh, wage labor capital or capital volume three, <laughs> Marx defines. No, but um page two seventy one. It's in the unpublished version of Yeah. 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 Um, so I mean that's that's sort of the thing. But also again, I, I think I need to make it clear, right? I mean, these are all positive things, but also we need to keep in mind class war continues even on after the revolution. You will continue to have rich people who want their crap back because they don't want dirty, poor, mongrel people <coughs> getting their nasty hands on it. And guess what? They need to be stopped, need to be vigilant. Um, other places in the world, uh, actually, I'll be perfectly frank with you. By the time the US goes, if the US goes, the world capital is gone. So we probably won't have to worry about this, but other countries will. Um, other, other countries are going to want to exploit resources and, and workers in any socialist country. And so they'll do their best to attack it and destroy it and undermine it. And we need to be vigilant against that. Um, we are going to have bureaucrats um, who realize, hey, if I abuse my power, uh, I bet I can get more under capitalism than I can under communism or socialism because I have to be fair about it. We need to be vigilant against them. Um, so there's still going to be struggle, there's still going to be work. And also, I mean, it's important to note, uh, human existence is filled with pain and suffering. 
Um, except when you're on the house lifting. Yeah, no, you know, there's still going to be heartbreak. There's still going to be grief. But one of the things about communism is why should it be based on a stupid and arbitrary economic system? Yeah. You know, why should we have to suffer? Not because, you know, a loved one dies or your know, relationships don't work out, um, but because some rich uh, jerk off. Jerk off. Jerk off. Jerk off. Yeah, I'll just go ahead. Okay. Come on. Um, <laughs> um, wants, wants a bigger mansion or another mansion. Or you're born in the wrong country. Or you're born in the wrong country. I mean, if you remember, for McCain, he didn't know how many homes he owned. Yeah, really? Yeah. I yeah. had a qualification. How many homes does white own? Second one. Yeah. Um, first one. Updated one. Yeah. Yeah. And then he left. Yeah, I mean, think about that. Uh, how many uh, here own your own home? A hot young one. Anybody, anybody here own your own home? Not a one. John McCain has so many homes, he literally doesn't know how many he has. That is the sort of system we are living under. Um, so again, it's, you know, obviously, you know, I can give these esoteric, you know, fantasy worlds where we live in communist utopia and blah, 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 blah. But it's really like, hey, why does this guy have seven homes and I don't have one? You know, I mean, that's, that's really the essence of communism. Six people living at homes. Uh, yeah. Six six families. Five, six five, families five. at least, yeah. Um, six collections of individuals. Maybe that part can also go. It's, it's important to point out that it's not like any It's all like the family the unit is the only unit. We have billions of their kids have got to be fair. It's been the bears. Up here? Yeah, uh, his wife is basically there. I know. Just, does, that, does that help? Do you have any other follow up questions? Critiques? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like, if the entire world caught on to like, like the entire world changed because of the revolution, like that we started in like, the United States, and then the whole world changed or whatever. I'm just trying, trying to think of like, how that would be. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll catch it all. Do probably still wait until the morning. Other countries already started. Yeah. Like, so there's some things that we might change. I think we might be asking you about the national question. Is that we're talking about like will there be different nations or was that not? Right, yeah, or is all it's gonna be like one homogenous huge <laughs> and that's complex. Um, it's called the national question. Self-determination for each nation. Yeah, well I mean there's a lot of different questions to that. But also I would say um, what would it be like if we had a worldwide communist revolution? Uh, I guess the entire world was communist and like believed in communist things. Like I, would that be a perfect world for you? It would be awesome. The best of all possible. I, I'm, I'm not going to go that far. But I mean, it's sort of like asking, well, what if the world stopped believing in monarchy? Or what if the world stopped believing in slavery? That would suck. You know, I mean, you are adorable. Uh, this is sort of, this is sort of the, the point, right? Under slavery, you can own an individual and exploit an individual as an individual. Under capitalism, you can own a person's labor and exploit that person's labor. Um, so what would it be like if we didn't exploit labor? Again, would it be perfect? No. Would people still hate each other? Uh, in some ways, yeah. Would there still be struggles? Would there still be conflicts? Would there still be people who are jerks? Yeah, of course. Um, would there be problems? Yes, absolutely. But also, a lot less. Yeah, because I'm, like, since I'm pretty new to this whole thing, like, I don't really know the ways I'm being screwed over too much. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I have, I have that in my blood. Um, so I guess yeah, a lot of things would be different if there was no like money system or an economic system holding us all back. Well, I mean, let me ask you this: Do you go to school? No. Why don't you go to school? I don't have enough money. You don't have enough money. Yeah, you'll notice there's enough classrooms. Uh, there's enough teachers. You know. Well, there could be. There could be more. Obviously, there could be more. Um, but here's the thing is we've all, at least I think, all of us who've been to school have been in a survey class where there's like 200 people. Adding one more student is not going to be bankrupt. I mean, it's not a great class, but adding one more student is not going to bankrupt, you know, the room. And what we could do is we could just have that for free or, you know, raise taxes 2% on the richest 1% and have it all completely paid for. But we don't because someone needs to make a cut. University needs to make a cut. 
um, the book publishers need to make a cut, um, all the people who supply the materials need to make a cut, and because all those people need to make a cut, people can't go to school. Um, so I mean, under socialism, you can actually go to school. Um, you know, that's one way your life would concretely would change. If you wanted to go to school, you could do it. Um, No, there are education systems in the Gulag. In fact, the Gulag was home. For those of you who don't know, the Gulag was uh, the Russian prison system. Uh, it was prison system and work camps. Um, basically, what the Gulag was is it's where criminals went. So if you were stealing stuff, if you were a murderer, um, if you were a political criminal, son of a daughter, three-year-old child. Uh, no, no. Petty criminals actually didn't get sent. Petty criminals didn't get sent to the gulag, or their children didn't, didn't get sent to the gulag unless they wanted to. Um, the way, well, I mean, that's the thing. The gulag were more like towns. They were open towns. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, there were homes. Um, you know, and that's why people went with their families. Um, it's just, I mean, obviously I'm not advocating the Zara system. People traveled with their They were like yesterday. Uh, right? The Czarist system? Yeah. No, that would be a new one. Yeah, here's the thing. Even under the Czarist system, entire families traveled through uh, the Czarist prison along. camps because they weren't like Western prisons. They're not like a bunch of cells. What they are is they're in towns. So you have a town, you have stores, uh, you have a home or an apartment. And so most of the people who chose to go to the gulag with their family. You could do either, and people did either all the time. If they had their own apartment, if they had their own job, um, as it was often the case, especially in, uh, in the Soviet Union with women, because they were treated equally, uh, a lot of women would just wait, or I mean not wait, I mean they would work, go to school, or raise their families in whatever city they were in. But if you didn't, oftentimes you would go with whoever was sentenced because you know you could be together, uh, you I mean, it's not like the American system where you can only see your family once every you know, couple months or every couple weeks, or you're only allowed one phone call. If they, if they, if you wanted to live with them, you were given that opportunity. To be clear, the people who were going to the gulags weren't just murderers and people. And I, I agree, the criminal system in the United States imprisons people unjustly, like drug crime. Um, but to be fair, there were some different kinds of arrests going to the gulags. Sure. Political. Sure. Let me ask you this then. What percentage of people were going to the gulag for political crimes? I have no idea. That seems like a very important question. Uh, you know, um, and in that case, um, there's different estimates. Um, the very uh, generous estimates have 10 percent. Um, most actually have it around uh, one to three percent. About the 10 million. No, that would be like. Uh, anywhere from one to maybe thirty thousand a year, and also uh, another thing. So that I thought the numbers were like twenty million over a decade. Yeah, um, there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, twenty million over a decade. Uh, let's see, what would one percent of twenty million be? What's two hundred thousand? There you go. Um, but even more than that, uh, another important question to ask um, is how long were those sentences? What was the average sentence of someone sent to the gulag? I, I don't know. Two years. And so actually, you would actually have a lot of repeat offen offenders, um, not just pol uh, political offenders, um, but also thieves, murderers, rapists. Um, this is part of the problem with the Soviet uh, work camp system is they granted amnesties all the time. Almost every single year, they granted an amnesty, um, mostly targeted towards political prisoners, so political prisoners were even more likely to get out. Um, but because these weren't like Western-style prison camps, if you showed that you were reformed, um, you could simply get back into society. A lot of thieves, for example, um, you know, swore they'd never do it again, return to society, stole again, swore they'd never do it again, return to society. And then also, additionally, again, they weren't like Western-style camps. They weren't like Nazi-style camps. They were like open, um, 
villages. And so plenty of people just escape. If you could if you could get together enough supplies, you could just walk to the next town. I could be wrong, but the descriptions I've heard of them are worse than the descriptions of even the Japanese in terms of the camps in World War II. Yeah, well um, I would put this out. Um, when Woken died, uh, built the anarchist out of the Gulag to attend his funeral. So And these these weren't just anarchists who were like, oh, we disagree with you. These were anarchists that were engaged in the Civil War, which include gutting Red Army soldiers and um, you know, running spikes through them. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, people were constantly released. There was constantly amnesty. And also, you should ask the question, who was writing these uh, descriptions? Um, I, heard it. I, I know Solzhenitsyn. <laughs> yeah, that, the big one, the big one that people go Stolenitsyn. I have Solzhenitsyn. I always forget his name. He wrote the Gulag Archipelago. Mm -hmm. um, Ar that, Ar yeah. Uh, either way, um, and uh, yeah, he was he was rich. He was elite. Um, I would actually recommend um, you check out, uh, or I can send it to you. There's an article um, on Cosmo Project about prison systems. Um, this is something people don't really realize uh, about the Gulag, is they actually, uh, people actually wanted to reform. Not everyone, mind you. Um, wanted so, to reform the Gulag system? No, wanted to reform themselves. Oh, they wanted to be retaught. Yeah. And so you have stories of, for example, people who were sent to the Gulag for petty crimes, um, being trained in Marxism-Leninism, and getting like Stalin tattoos across their chest. <laughs> yeah, I'd prefer to clockwork orange in this, you know. I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I mean. It never happened. Um, um, yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. They, what they like to do is characterize the gulag system as this uh, vast, efficient, uh, No, I, I don't see it as that at all. I see it as a system where people, like, I think it was 2% of all the people who went through the gulag died in the gulag. Two percent? Yeah. Yeah. The old people. Two percent. No, I'm talking about people. Two percent. These were two percent attributed to starvation. Right. Yeah. Of oh, what number though? Of uh, um, twenty million. Yeah. Here's the thing about that. Um, there's three things. Um, I, I I think it's a high number. It's in the tens of millions. Yeah. There's three things to point out about people who died in the blood system. Um, two percent is actually a relatively low number. Not for me. Sorry. Well, it's just it's you, better than any capital. Starving to death in prisons is just not okay. It's I mean, not there, I mean, were these during famine years? I mean, yeah. that's important. To be fair, yeah, yeah so siege of Leningrad. Uh, a lot of people died in Leningrad. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, <coughs> I I don't like that either, and I think that happened because of capitalism. But I think we can't say no. capitalism no. isn't okay. Cap starvation is under capitalism. It affects starvation under communism. That's okay. It affected Russia inevitably. Well, there's the thing, though. You have to define starvation, though, as was there food uh, that could have been also to be fed to these people? Right, and I, I get or, the difference. But or were they withholding food from them? Like, I mean, that's, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. Uh, you, had, you had a lack of food across the country. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference to say we don't have enough food to food, feed everyone, and so we're going to distribute it as equally as possible, and that means that several, or most of us, almost all of us, go on starvation rations. Okay? That's a big difference from... I have a bunch of food, but I can't get market value for it, so I'm going to burn it. A good I, I agree. That's horrible. But we cannot get rid of the concept that violent revolutions sometimes can lead to huge famines, and maybe there's a better way to do it other than disrupting a huge system and then having millions upon millions of people die of starvation. Children die of starvation. People are dying of starvation right now. In Absolutely. In we need to large stop numbers. It. We yeah. need to stop it. By and any means necessary. By stopping capitalism. Yeah, also yes. a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, Russia, at least twice a century, uh, because of weather patterns, would have famines. Famines happen all the time under the Tsar. Not again. Both by the inefficiency of the Tsar system, but also because of weather patterns. Uh, because of those weather, weather patterns, the Soviet Union was beginning, beginning to have a famine. Collectivization stopped that. You never had another like weather or production created famine ever again in the Soviet Union. 
I don't know, that seems pretty good. I mean, you want to be like, but there are people starving. By the statistical methods, uh, which are non-birth, so I want, this needs to be talked about. The deaths in the Soviet Union, some of those deaths are literally called non-births, okay? What this is, is this is a death that occurs because people don't have ch uh, the children they otherwise would have had. Okay, so think about that. You're counting as a death, a birth. Are you talking about miscarriage? Not about miscarriage. Just it's projected population patterns and that it cuts off and so, but I'm not, I'm not including those. I'm including. No, I, if you're talking 20 million, you are including those. I'm uh, 20 million people dying? Yes. No, he, he didn't say that. Uh, he was saying 20 million people. Two, two percent he was saying 2% of 20 million people in the, uh, in the gulag. 20 million, maybe as high as 60 million. Yeah, here's the thing. Yes, as high, as high as 60 million people pass through the, uh, the, the gulags over Stalin's regime, under Stalin's regime. Yeah, and again, a couple of things to keep in mind. Those were families. Are you absolutely sure that non-births weren't included in that? The 2%? Hold on. The 2%? I, no, I'm not actually. I'm not, but... But that starts, I mean, we've seen the pictures of the camps, and I'm not saying that capitalism has done horrible things. I'm just saying these were not livable conditions. These were horrible conditions, and they're not humane. Compared to and what? we can't tolerate it as, oh, well, we're going to see the Soviet Union as romantic and beautiful, and it was the people's revolution. No, people starved, and these conditions were horrible. And we can't just say, oh, nonchalantly, oh, uh, well, screw it, because it was insignificant. Yeah, because no, it wasn't insignificant. That's it was a very significant. It shaped Russian ideology, and it still shapes Russian ideology. That's a very good argument you're making against no one who's here. No one is saying that people didn't starve in the Soviet Union. Good. And what you'll good. notice is constantly being referred to. Were those people in the prison camp who were starving, were they starving at a rate significantly higher than the rest of the people in the Soviet Union? No. The food was equally, equally distributed. When you have a famine, when you have a civil war, when you have an invasion um, that burns crops, when you have rebellions of people who would rather burn their own crops, slaughter their own animals, rather than turn them over to starving people. And this was not the Soviets who were doing this, okay? This was the Ukrainians and the Kulaks, okay? So who, why, my question to you is, why are you blaming the victims Right? You're acting as though the Soviet Union created these conditions, and then you're blaming them for these conditions, when in fact these very conditions were created by four big things. The weather, the kulaks, the imperialists, and the civil war. Okay? Those weren't the only contributing factors. Okay. Then name the fifth, sixth, seventh, and ninth. I think. Substantiate 
everything you want me to substantiate. And if that's your only criticism against my argument, I think that's poor. I mean, actually attack my argument. Well, we then actually, well okay, okay, let me give you the rebuttal then. No, actually, nothing like that happened. Um, in fact, the Soviet Union was actually a great place where our workers decided everything, and nobody starved to death there. That's your argument, given back to you. Yeah, and also, sorry if I may. I, you know, I, this is a reoccurring problem. Do you believe what the government tells you about Iraq? Do you believe what they tell you about Afghanistan? Do they believe? Do you believe what they tell you about immigrants? Do you believe what they Why tell you? I tell you uh, uh, believe what you tell me about these things. Because huh? uh, they mean, go to primary documents. Um, the doc yeah, and so does the government. No, I don't believe that we were in Iraq for Iraqis because uh, uh, because Dick Cheney's company uh, made billions of dollars and their stock price went up. That's why I believe sure. that we weren't in there. Why do I believe that the Russian government wasn't this great uh, bureaucracy that, that helped people and increased the living span of people? Why? Because of the pictures of the dead bodies, Greg. Uh -huh. Because of all American history that says these were horrible things. Because yeah, of, all of Russian history. families who came here uh -huh. because of situations in, in Russia. All American histories. I, I like how, about, how about Bennett? Her family came over from Russia because of the starvation, and they came to America. She's a history professor. How about her story? How about her story of 20s and 30s, uh, in the 20s and 30s, her Russian family coming here uh -huh. to a capitalist country because they were starving to death in Russia? Oh, and who was refusing to sell the Soviet Union food even though the Soviet Union was willing to pay gold in it? The United States. Oh, okay. So Western what again is you're blaming, them, you're blaming the victim. They were willing to trade gold, gold for food, and the Western powers refused to accept that. So they refused to, the, the Soviet government attempted to buy food. You haven't at all touched on any of the conditions. If you look on uh, the, the Ukrainian uh, transport station in Kiev, it's a primary document. It lists three reasons why people die, right? And this is what your garbage sources use. One, the reason why they weren't, uh, a reason why they died is one, because the Communist Party policies we're not being followed through to allow people to carry provisions. You want to blame the communist government, then then you should say, well, I'm blaming it because of its policies. If its policies are not America, yeah. a constitution in complete action would ensure all rights, but it didn't. Did it? Yeah, actually, then that shows a lack of knowledge about the American <laughs> constitution on your part. A fundamental constitution, not the way it was changed. Well, the imaginary right. constitution? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Thomas Jefferson. Guys, let's keep, hey, uh, guys, let's keep this civil. Name a year. Name a year of the Constitution. Uh, 1784. Jefferson. Okay. 1784. Still had the compromise. Three-fifths compromise. Okay. Still had black people being three-fifths of a person. Okay. What, what my point was in trying to be hyperbolic was saying that just because of government policies, might be perfect. It, they're not perfect unless they're actually carried out. And so I might attribute the fact that the Leninist regime, uh, the Leninist ideology was right. And Stalin was right and had every good intention, but he, he didn't do it right, obviously. Yeah. It, it didn't, didn't work. Do it. Okay, see now again, filled with presuppositions. Didn't well, do it did. It worked perfectly. Great. So, so the criteria is perfection. Did communism work? Did everybody yes. have the quality? Was everybody equal? More or less, yes. Come on, Greg. There no, see, you just come on me. You're just like, come on. But yet, when I'm giving you, I'm giving you primary documents. Look it up. Transport documents on Kiev. Okay. Unsanitary conditions. Guess what? Why are those unsanitary? Because they came from Tsarist Russia. Okay? There were unsanitary conditions all across the globe. And guess what? You can even look at the most reactionary bourgeois capitalist historians. And guess what? They have to admit there's a reason why they emphasize the death toll. It's because if they didn't, they'd have to emphasize the life expectancy. If they, the life expectancy went from about 30 to about 60. It could, doubled. Could that have been attributed to all the sick? and the people who have predisposition to die, die. I, I don't know if you know how life expectancy works. Yeah, that gets figured in. No, that would so. drop it. Okay, where uh, I, I might even be willing to accept that that's true and that literacy went, rates went up, but what were those literacy rates being used for? And more importantly, 
How can you romanticize this? How am I romanticizing this? Saying that it was, it was Com justified. It, it was good. justified. Oh, it was good. Compared to what? Some magical fantasy liberal regime where no, food not compared falls to that. from the sky and Star Trek. <laughs> compared to Star Trek, it was yeah. Um, we're not dealing. We're not dealing with your imaginary regime. We're dealing with a regime that had, been under Tsar, uh, Tsarist Russia, had a lower production uh, amount than Czechoslovakia. World War One, the Civil War, the embargoes, the invasions, and famine conditions. Okay, you point to me any country in the history of the world that has faced such conditions and has managed to have as minimal amount of starvation as possible by the same rubric that you apply, which includes, uh, you know what, I'm just gonna say it, bullshit statistics. Non-births, non-births are the sort of thing that they use. Uh, they use population decline. Why did the population decline? They don't say why, they don't explain why. Just if there was less population, then as a matter of fact, those people must have starved to death under uh, Stalin. Excess mortality, okay, excessive mortality. What excessive mortality means is we have a, a prediction on how many people are going to die, and if it goes above that, then it must have been starvation or murder, okay? Those are, just on their face, superficial uh, statistics. Yeah, you know what? You can show me a body of starved Ukrainians. Guess what? I can show you the body of starved Okies. Because our we shouldn't have either. And you you are glad to demonize the American conservatives and the American uh, capitalists for these deaths. And you're willing to use wounded knee statistics. And yet, when the same statistics of uh, the Kronstadt and all of these other things are put against you, you say, no, they're just not. Yeah. And can't you see the hypocrisy? It's not. The fact that you cannot understand the justifying and moral reasoning does not make it hypocrisy. Okay, Let well, me, will you please explain to me yes, I'm your go, moral I'm going to, explanation? Yes, I'm going to explain it to you right now. If there's a condition of privilege such that there are goods and those goods are not distributed, that is morally unjust. If it is not the case that there are goods, and therefore, those goods are not distributed, the non-existent goods, that is not morally deplorable. You can't give people something you don't have. I agree, but why was Stalin having feasts and eating plenty of things? Yeah, Stalin wasn't having feasts. He had several homes. He brought in hookers. All Where? The time. Where? We have no, a journal. Hold we on, have if you brought, if you brought in hookers, that's dancer. No. We have evidence. Russian you scholars are have lying evidence. and slandering Stalin right now. Yes. Seabag Montefer. Seabag Montefer. He is a, 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 a well-respected American, I mean, no, not American, but well-respected in the American Academy, which I respect. Yeah, Seabag Montefer. He is literally a British aristocrat who is a historian. He has made it his life's work to vilify Stalin. Uh, maybe you've heard of, maybe someone here has heard of the book, In the Court of the Red Tsar. He is literally calling Stalin a red communist czar, okay? This is not, well, you're pretending there is. But even him. Uh -huh. Yeah, you are. Houses, Guys, how many civil, houses, keep it civil. How many houses, houses did Stalin have? How many? Zero. He had zero houses. Come on. Zero houses. There were had complexes which he lived in, there and he was he, he was served huge meals, and he had lavish parties with fellow good Stalinist communists who were glad to just shut up and listen to him. Yeah, two things. One, and plays. He had people come from all over Europe to sing what, to him what and book dance is, to him. Did you read that in the book? Yeah. What book? Are you sure it was a book? Are you sure it wasn't? Yeah, it might not have been a video game. Okay, uh, here's the thing. In the Court of the Red Tsar, again, it's an anti Stalinist work. The very introduction talks about Bolshevik modesty. Who here has read In the Court of the Red Tsar? Or at least I've read what you're referring to. Yeah, this is someone whose, again, goal is to vilify Stalin. Literally, Bolshevik modesty. Literally, they required, Stalin especially, that people not use their position for excess. You say he brought in hookers. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, 
all across the board, any serious historian of Stalin uh, actually says the exact opposite of what you're saying, which is he either was, he was basically non-sexual or uh, he became disinterested in sexuality because he had his heart broken from when his wife died. This is romantic bullshit. No, it's not, it's coming from, okay. See, anything I say is romantic bullshit. I'm giving you, not, not a communist source. What is your source to say that his heart was broken so he didn't have a In the court of the Red Tsar. <laughs> in the court, I'm not quoting Ludo Marx. In the court of the Red Tsar. Yes. He had his heart broken yes. so he didn't have hookers. Uh, and so he didn't have hookers. Yes. He was in the court of the Yes. Red Tsar. It literally said that one of the best ways to piss off Stalin, uh, what, especially by the female Bolsheviks, was to attempt to seduce him. There was nothing that he hated more than that. Also, where did you read that? What book was that again? Was it in a book? Are you sure it wasn't? I think it was a book. Nothing? Yeah. Red Alert is not, in fact, an accepted peer review source. I don't know what Red Alert is. Uh, it's an anti Soviet game. Because you said it's in a game, That's, it's in that game. I don't want to pretend that any other system is better than Stalin. Clearly, Stalin wasn't. Okay, hold on a second. Prophetic. Too clearly, we person. can do better. He wasn't. Give me the concrete policies that Stalin should have carried out. He signed off on death warrants on fellow communists in the thousands. Which ones? No. Several. Which ones? After the Great Purge. I mean, we like, have which ones? the actual which signing orders. orders. Which right. ones? Right. What, what were they charged with? Were what they charged with anti-revolutionary activity? Was was they were good communists. How about the right. South Africans that came right. up? to meet with him, to talk what about revolutionary actions in South Africa. Africa. These were devote Stalinists, and they were put into the gulag. Yeah, and who put them there? Stalin! No. Yazda China. You don't Come even on. know what you're talking about. Come on. Who, who led the Great Terror? Who led Stalin the Great was in control when the Great Terror happened. Yes, because he is Vishnu, the avatar of supreme control. They <laughs> That's what you like to say. No, that isn't what I like to say. So he wasn't then. He wasn't in supreme control, that's correct. Well, when did I ever? Very good. I think, I think we've made a break through that. I think we can I acknowledge this non-prophetic and non-compulsory geniusness that you seem to think he has. Yeah, also, I want to point something out. Every step of the way, your response is, oh, come on! Come on! That's not an argument. I think, I think it comes from a position where I cannot uh, vocalize what I mean. I think that's why we say, can't you understand? I think that's I don't why say, we say those things. Yeah, here's the thing. You'll notice I don't say can't you understand. No, no. I don't. I, yeah, I give you, you know, something. And, and if you're criticizing me on the fact that I'm not as good a debater as you, you're right. Uh, it's not. But, it has absolutely nothing to do about debate. You made one of the most slanderous claims you can make against someone. How, how many here would be like, yeah, you get 14 year old prostitutes to have sex with you? Who would here uh, would feel uh, a little, I don't know, deplorable about that? I myself wouldn't like to be charged with having 14-year-old prostitutes. How about you guys? Not really. Oh, I wouldn't pray. Oh, okay. But yet you made that claim. You literally made that claim without any source or substantiation. official. It has absolutely nothing. A journal from a, a, a gallerina, I believe, that was in a, a parade for Stalin. And she wrote in her diary. What's your name? I don't remember. It's a Russian she just complex. I can give you the source. What? Are there any other facts backing up that she is? No, but it, it is my source. Is okay. So it's someone we don't know in a diary whose journal that we don't know, uh, with no facts backing it up, when we have a vowed anti Stalinist. Anti Stalinist? I'm anti Stalinist. Yeah, I know, except they at least attempt to give it a pretense of fact and history. I know for a fact that there are many anti Stalinists who could. Argue with you very better. Okay, I'm more better than I can. And I'm not saying I know enough to validate what I'm saying, but I do know a difference between right and wrong. Apparently not. I do. That's what's an issue. Now I'm not able to debate somebody who's talked about socialism and studied communism for so long on a level. With okay, you, right? I want to, but I don't think it's right for you to dictate what the RSU's policies and opinions on these things are with nobody challenging you. 
Yeah, and I think somebody should challenge you on an anti spelling okay. sign. A line. And I think everybody who has does have to leave the RSU. Unfortunately. Yeah, that's bullshit. And also, let me show your absolute intellectual dishonesty. All right. One, you just presuppose you're right. Well, I'm not bright enough to, or knowledgeable enough, or whatever you want to say, to argue against you, but somebody could. There's some magical person out there who, not based on facts, not based on work, but you just create. I think there are no, facts. No, hold on. I didn't let you say what you were you saying. Do. You, the least you can do, especially since ostensibly this is uh, a lecture I'm I'm running. The least you can do is let I'd me like to make a motion. I'm saying. I'd like to let it actually you now. Yeah. I think Rich finish what he says and then make your motion. Two things. Okay. Two big things. One, you just presuppose you're yeah. right. That's why you presuppose there's someone who can argue against me. I, on the other hand, am basing things on facts. Uh, I give you citations. I give you sources. I ask you for your citations and your sources. And I get things like, maybe that was from a video game. That is the height of intellectual dishonesty. To presuppose you're right, just, just, uh, without any, any basis. You know who's right is the person who can present the most compelling facts, who has the both knowledge and can present the compelling reason. You can say, look, I don't know. I don't know if you're right, I don't know if you're wrong. But to say, I know there's someone who could argue against you uh, is intellectually dishonest in the extreme. And second, that is absolute bullshit. That those people, that I dictate RSU policies. Nobody, back me up, no one has had more things, except for maybe Chris, uh, more votes go against what they wanted than me. Right? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't that's things. Uh, okay. Uh, Jacob, <laughs> myself, and Chris. Okay? These are, we are the hardcore Stalinists. Why don't you ask those people who say they're run off from the RSU? What policies? No, uh, so they, <laughs> oh, uh, what policies they pursue? Josh, uh, let's. Uh, uh, Maybe, maybe you don't mind if I cut through the bullshit. What you're talking about is peace and justice. That's what you're talking about. No, when you're not specifically, but there are some members in the peace and justice section. Okay, before you, say, before you start, before you start saying anything about any other club, we should probably call this meeting. No, closed. here's what I want. I am actually, this well, is the thing. I am being attacked and slandered. I don't this isn't about your ego. We, we are a club. We are a democratic yeah, club. This is not about your ego, Greg. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not. not. It's about defending somebody from uh, slanderous claims, which are false. Okay. If, though, if my I, I support were Greg's considered position. considered slanderous against Stalin, that's fine. But if they were considered and I think slanderous it's against disrespectful you, I apologize to slander someone completely. on the day I did not intend to slander Greg. Because remember, it's the 66th yeah. year yeah. of uh, the liberation of the Auschwitz death camps from Nazi Germany by the Red Army and Stalin. So I think it's very disrespectful what you're doing. Hold on. Okay. Either either we need to either we need to organize this so that somebody is mediating this debate, yes. that we keep that we keep personal slanders out of this completely, or we need to call this meeting to an end. That's my motion. I, I motion. I'd Sorry. like to make a formal Sorry. motion that we end the meeting and carry on this in a formal debate yeah. uh, and organize it with the conference committee. Um, I'm willing to I am willing to go with that, but I also want to address a claim. The claim was made that I dictate RSU. And yeah, you know what? Feel uncomfortable. Uh, there was a claim that was made, which is I dictate RSU policy and do so unchallenged. Wait, oh. wait, can I say something about that? Absolutely. Why do you care though? I mean, who cares? I don't mind. I mean, if someone thinks that, I don't care if they think that. I, I like listening to you. I mean, I mean, you are knowledgeable, Chris is knowledgeable. Whoever says that, I mean. I don't think it's a bad thing. Well, this is the thing, though, is this carries on a reputation that's false about the RSU, and other clubs go and spread this uh, also. And that's why we have some people throughout the RSU. We're, in fact, we've just even never been. Right, but how do you, you, the only way to fix that is to change the image, right? I mean, yeah. what if Back, back to you said the plan. Let Diego finish. This is finish. why we're addressing the plan. I mean, this is a very long gotcha. Chris, are you going to, if this discussion continues, are you going to mediate it so that we have one person speaking at a time and we uh, keep personal slanders uh, out of it? I'm willing to do that. What? I'm willing to do that to say I don't need to take it. Was Stalin alive in the time of Hitler? Yes. Okay. Stalin, uh, Stalin, Stalin, Stalin. Okay, hold on. May I submit a motion? I submit a motion that the uh, 
meeting will formally end after Greg has the ability to make the quick response to the standing issue and that it may continue afterwards under what forms that people want to. Does anybody second that motion? I second the motion. All right, all in favor of the motion. The meeting will formally end after all Greg has the chance the to address that. All, all the motion. Can I make another motion? All abstaining from the motion. Okay, uh, motion carries. Can I make a motion to sing the international? <laughs> That's the finish the meeting. That's part of the agenda. So, um, so Greg has, uh, given the motion, we just passed Greg and I'll have uh, a chance to respond and then we'll about the meeting internationally. I would say there are three clear things. One, this is a democratic club. Anyone who was run off had the ability, just like every person, not even members, every person to make a motion. If they wanted the policies to be carried out differently, it was incumbent upon them to make a motion to do so, not to spread rumor and slander here. It's a democratic organization. It's always been a democratic organization. And if any one of those people who re you refuse to name, which is fine, could have become a member, made a motion, and voted on it. They chose not to. On its face, this is prima facie a slander. Second, since when have I ever been in the RSU without resistance? Watch that Kronstadt lecture again. Watch the Situationist lecture again. Watch the Anarcho-Primitivist lecture again. Josh West can tell you that he was the most vocal and outspoken critic of me every single step of the way from the very moment he entered the RSU. You can correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's true. Okay. So it has nothing to do about me not having any resistance. It has everything to do with those who disagree about policies, who disagree about positions, being too cowardly, cowardly, to propose their motions, or to engage in honest debate. Open debate has been offered to every single individual, every single ideology, and I will continue to offer that. And if those people think that I am dictating policy, or I am dictating the opinions of the RSU, they would do well to read our opinions. The only opinions of the RSU are the ones that are democratically approved, which has nothing to do with Stalin, Nothing to do with communism, nothing to do with anarchism. And if they disagree with my views personally, I will take any and all of them on in a formal public debate. But I can make this challenge easily because I know of the cowardly nature of those people making it. But you know what? Next time they say it, tell them. I have made that claim. Chris has made that claim. Anyone, public debate, anytime, anywhere, me alone, against however many of them want to come. Okay? And third, this hysterical outburst has nothing to do with the discussion of Stalin. Okay? Stalin is a historical uh, argument to be had, made with evidence, made with, I would hope, intellectual honesty, rather than emotional pleading to logical fallacies. And what I personally view and argue for with Stalin has absolutely nothing to do with the RSU policies, and for you as an attempt in the last word to link my views of Stalin and my defense of Stalin with anything that has to do with an, the RSU as an organization, I think is absolutely deplorable and slanderous and immaterial. And it indicates to me that because you are losing the argument, or perhaps by your view not losing the argument, but unable to respond, that it was okay to attack me personally and organizationally, and I find that deplorable. Now, admittedly, uh, it was a motion to have me say, but I would more than happy to have, have you have the last word, and I'll say no, no more about this. I'm sticking to the proposed motion. Okay, well then, uh, let's get very